Every time I come up here, I wish everybody a happy Pentecost, and it's my favorite Sunday after Pentecost. And she says, the joke has played itself out. So that is the last time I will be telling that joke. And uh, so I, I know that some of you will be very broken up about it. Um, <laughs> so uh, ushering in. So I just wanted to make mention that we are going to, you, obviously you were not ushered in, but you will be ushered out at the end of the service uh, through the middle so that way uh, there's not a choke point by the front door. Uh, offering is in the back, but bulletin should be in the, in the pews. And if there are anything else that you would need, just let us know. Um, each morning, the, or each Sunday, the doors are going to open at 8.30, so come early if you want to get a good seat up front. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Otherwise, we're going to have our President Mark come and say a few words. Good morning. Um, I guess the first thing is, as we get into the cooler season here, maybe be advised, CDC is telling us we've got to keep windows, airflow, and all that, so I came anticipating maybe a little bit cooler in here, but it's still pretty warm, so uh, going forward uh, for a while, you may want to think, you know, if we have this cooler weather next week. And you're back next Sunday, you might want to think maybe having to dress just a little bit warmer. So um, we, we need to continue following those guidelines, you know, where they're kind of pushing to limit the length of the service, certain things. But um, what I have here is some, some information about uh, moving forward, looking for a pastor. Uh, we did meet this past Wednesday. Pastor Steve Brackett I was here from the Northeast Iowa Synod. Uh, I had talked with Linda Hudgens probably a month ago, uh, right after we learned that Pastor Adam was going to be leaving. Uh, but there are two positions over there that are in going through the process of retirement, resignations, etc. So um, they were kind of saying, you know, maybe in October. I put a call in. Uh, Pastor Brackett was able to come up uh, this past Wednesday, so I felt good that uh, at least, you know, we're, we're starting that process. Uh, one of my first questions was about getting an interim pastor after I had talked to Linda Hudgens pastor reassured us we are already on the list for an interim pastor ASAP you know sounding pretty good the bad part of that is there are next to zero if any available at this time currently in our synod there are 29 openings uh, pastoral positions so uh, that, that's where it puts us <laughs> and doesn't mean it'll take three years four years it could be some stroke of luck or a godsend that we get somebody you know much sooner than that we'll just have to hope things work out uh, so at this time we will continue uh, our in-house or using our in-house members to deliver the message um, and we encourage anyone interested with lecturing to let a council member know. And at this time, Isaiah, is, uh, we've been in communication with him. We have several others in the congregation that uh, have kind of hinted that they would be willing to come up and deliver the message for us. Um, we also have a list of possible supply pastors that may be willing to help. Um, some obviously are already being used, and the virus has kept many others from really wanting to step forward to help out. So again, we're kind of behind the eight ball with that as well. Uh, we also have been in contact with several area pastors to see how they may be of help. Um, I have talked to Pastor Best, Pastor Coffin. Um, they've both indicated, you know, in times of emergencies, we have, you know, Funerals, emergency contact people, um, contact the church office, contact myself. We will get in touch with them. They'll be willing to help out as, as much as they can, uh, especially in those emergency type situations. Um, we are looking ahead to holidays. Um, we know that's going to be an issue. 
Um, you know, if we're still limited space-wise, you know, who knows what's going to happen by you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas. But we'll, you know, I guess since this happened in council meetings, we've said, you know, it's just kind of a month-by-month -month thing, and we'll see what happens. Um, so at least, you know, we are trying to look out into the future. Um, and both pastors that I talked to, Best and Coffin, have said, you know, in some way possible, they would try and get here. Uh, same goes for communion. You know, if we get to that point, we just need to say, hey, can we get somebody to come in so we can have, you know, communion, say, at the end of October. Uh, we have All Saints Day coming up, um, those types of things. So we are looking ahead. Um, but like I said, it's just kind of a challenging time right now. Um, the council will be creating a list and contact members to create a call committee. <clears throat> Uh, this needs to be done uh, and set before the Synod will come back for the second meeting. So, you know, if you are contacted, please, you know, give really strong consideration to help us out in that need. Um, and, you know, we will look as much as possible for a variety of uh, personnel to be on that committee so that uh, we can meet the needs of many, many people. Um, time frame. We hope this will all come together sooner than later, but it may be later than sooner. Uh, we just all have to keep working and doing what we can. Just remain patient. Um, I know there's lots of opinions about the past and about the future. Um, please try and remain positive with that. Um, you know, beating each other up or negative thoughts aren't going to help a lot of things move forward. So. Um, We'll do the best we can, and like I said, with that call committee, we'll try and get that variety that hopefully covers a lot of the issues. So, lots of prayers for guidance, um, and it might also be a good idea just to keep your fingers crossed, and uh, we will update as we can as we move forward. Um, I know there's probably lots of questions out there. We really don't have many answers right now, um, but I think we will be in continual contact with the Synod. Um, I've gotten two packets that are about that thick, so lots of things to, you know, look over and hopefully, you know, we, like I said, we can get somebody that will be willing to come in and uh, not be two or three years down the road, but it's just the way it is right now. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, hope you have a great week. Thank you, Mark. So let's enter into a time of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving and grace and go on our ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our needs for those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness, to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
all who worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. That we may live out your impassioned response to the hungry and the poor. That we may live out truth and justice and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. For peace in our hearts. In our homes, for friends and family, for life and for love, for our work and our play. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie. That you center our lives in the water and the word. That you nourish our souls with your body and blood. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and our failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Excuse me a second. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions, Remember me according to your steadfast love for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. You are great. Now the reading from the book of Philippians, the second chapter. If then there is encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was from God, 
for though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling bo you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Amen. So again, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you for having me up here. I feel very grateful that I, I am up here again. Uh, I've always felt what I lack in pastoral talent, I make up for in enthusiasm. So as promised, this week uh, will be a continuation of last week's theme. Uh, while this week builds on the other, it is, it's not like it's a requirement that you had to have heard last week's message. It basically boils down to this, being present in Christ, being present and thoughtful and intentional with our actions. What, uh, what that means and the foundation of where that presence comes sort of transitions into what we're talking about this week. So I was listening, I was, I was actually watching a TV show and it had one of my favorite actors on there. Uh, one of my favorite actors was speaking uh, and he was actually speaking about comedy. And he's an incredibly dramatic actor and so it was odd that he was talking about comedy. Um, but he said something like this, comedy needs to be exquisite. If it's anything less, then what's the point? And it was this comment that I was really thinking about uh, when I was writing last week's message and then certainly this week's message. Uh, and that appears to be the spirit of what Paul is saying in his, uh, in his letters here. In everything you do, be present in that moment. Be present in the embrace of Christ. Give that moment everything that you've got. If you give it any less, What's the point? Last week we read from Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We spoke of the first part, and we're going to dive into the second part today, and in where he goes in chapter 2. So I make no qualms about it. I think Paul is an absolutely fabulous writer. He knows how to grab somebody's attention right away. He is the ultimate attention grabber. It's a style of writing, it's a style of speaking uh, that, that is very successful. To grab the audience's attention uh, as soon as you can and then try and hold on to it for just long enough to get your point across, but not so long that the audience gets bored. For instance, I felt ill earlier this week. So I got your attention, right? In this day and age, that is the ultimate attention grabber. Well, the reason I felt ill is not the obvious. It's not what you would think. Uh, and let me explain. So, um, I guess, has anybody here eaten a grasshopper? No. Okay, I can tell from some of your looks that I've already lost you. So, let me, uh, let me explain. So, I was mowing my lawn Monday, and it was dry, and it was dusty, and my nose started to get plugged. And so, uh, I, was, I was mowing my lawn with my mouth open, sort of like this, as you do, uh, and I turned a corner, and wouldn't you know it, a grasshopper flew straight into my mouth, and it hit the back of my throat. So let me just say, this was not a small grasshopper. This was a very large, it was as large as a raven, even. It was large, and it didn't even hit my lips. It just smacked to the back of my throat. So I did what anybody would do in that situation. I panicked. And as my eyes started watering, and I started to choke, I, I thought to myself, okay, so this is how 
I'm going to die. <laughs> this is how I'm going to be remembered, as the guy who choked on a grasshopper. And so I, and it really kind of just lasted a span of a heartbeat, but reflexively, I swallowed, which I'm sure it was just as a surprise to the grasshopper as it was to me. This actually happened. I'm not making it up. And so I felt ill. I tell you this story because I believe, unless I miss my mark, that I've got your attention. So Paul does this in his writing. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a win-win if I've ever heard one. What do we fear most? What are our phobias? I know somebody who has a true phobia of snakes. Even the word snakes starts to get their skin to crawl. Me saying snakes probably is bothering this person, if she were listening. Snakes is what I'm saying. Because she's here right now, sorry. <laughs> she's got a real phobia. There's a true, uh, you know, people are truly afraid of heights. People are truly afraid of the dark, speaking in front of people. And I know that, and I'm not joking here, I have a, I have a fear of how bugs move. Like they crawl along, how they creep along, I can't tell how they're feeling, uh, I can't predict how they're moving, and I truly get freaked out when they fly at my face. It, that is kind of ironic, as far as the story goes. One of the biggest fears that is shared by the largest part of our population is the fear of death, of the fear of the unknown. But not Paul. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So to die is gain. What is that? To die is gain, the church of Philippi said. To die is gain, we echo. What is that? Who says that? What could he mean by that? What is the point of that? What is he saying? Does Paul have our attention? Paul is making a distinction between merely having an existence and actually truly living. He echoes this theme in this week's lesson where he explains how people can get trapped in this cycle of just going through the motions that we end up behaving outside the will of God. He grabs everybody's attention first and then says, to be Christ-like, you must tailor your actions to be like Christ. We must give everything that we've got into that relationship. I heard once that a relationship is not a 50-50. Right? It is 100% and 100%. And I think we can agree that God is there 100%. He is there, rooting us on, giving us that encouragement, giving us that tough love that we don't want but desperately need. God is there for us 100% of the time, giving it his all. For us, what a strange thing to think about. That we, the flawed, lazy at times, ungrateful at times, that our God meets us at his 100%. So where are we? That's the question, right? Where are we? How much effort are we giving that relationship? This distinction between, in the life of Christ, the distinction of living there in the life of Christ and, and merely living is big. It is the point. It tends to be the main point of Paul's letter to the Philippians. There's only four chapters in this book. And he spends one of them saying, thank you very much for your encouragement. Thank you, I, thank you for, me, for telling me to take heart. I need you to as well. I have Christ in my prison and in my solitude and in my suffering and in my joy. Christ is here with me. I am alive. And as Norm would say, and I am grateful but if I were to die, if I were to die as I am surely going to do, I take comfort in the fact that I will get to be with the Lord. To stand before the throne of Jesus Christ and be received into his presence. There is no greater gain than this. The things of the world are mere trinkets that are perishing and passing away compared with that prospect. The greatest and most glorious experience that any human soul can ever undertake is to behold Christ. It is to see and savor that experience. 
It is to be in his immediate presence, with glorified eyes and with glorified body, stand faultless before the throne, clothed in the perfect righteousness that is Christ, to behold his glory and his majesty. That is the greatest pleasure. That is the greatest satisfaction. That is the purpose by which we were created, to stand there and behold him. And just like that Damascus road, to be converted to Jesus Christ and to be born again in the Spirit. We all have our own Damascus road. We have that moment in our life where we made that commitment to Christ. And just like last week, it is imperative that we do something with it. That we are present in that commitment. That it doesn't just sit on a shelf. That each and every day we recommit ourselves to Christ. That we seek him each and every day. That is what makes or breaks a relationship. You've heard how people will grow apart. You hear that often. We've just grown apart. Well, the first step to stop that from happening is to recommit. And put that person at the forefront of your mind each and every day. So Cassie says this often, if you see yourself, if you feel yourself distanced from God, who do you think moved? We move away when we are not actively moving toward. We move away when we become complacent. And we cannot allow that to happen. It is through discovery and rediscovery that that wonder and that joy enters our life. It is complacency that breeds boredom and wayward thinking. Fear keeps us where we feel comfortable. And Jesus is very clear on what he thinks of that. Run. Run from that line of thinking. Run from it. We cannot allow ourselves to become comfortable. Comfortability is a threat to faith. The question should be, how can I go deeper how can I make myself uncomfortable? If fear stagnates growth, how can I overcome it? This is not just plopping down and setting out a flag for Jesus and expecting it all to happen. No, fear stops us from truly living. Fear makes everything a bit introspective, doesn't it? But we've got something that banishes all of that. We've got something that lifts us up and allows us to truly be free. And that is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is manifested in our faith. Fear limits us. Faith emboldens us. Fear shuts us in. Faith calls us out. Fear turns us inward, and faith drives us onward. All of us have experienced a lot of fear over the last six months. It's completely different than like having a near miss on the roadway or, or having some freak accident that gets your heart pumping and then that aftermath where you have the, the adrenaline rush and the praise of God and that, and that faith strengthens you. It's different than that. We are living in the time of holy moly. Have we ever experienced a six months that has lasted six years before? When do we transition? When do we feel like Jesus took the wheel? When are we turning the corner to, praise God, I am so thankful I made it through my fear? When will we feel comfortable to abandon our fear? Christ calls us every day. Are we ready to pick up? Paul is our model for this. Fear does not appear to be in Paul's vocabulary. Fear does not motivate his decision-making. Fear does not keep him silent. Fear doesn't even stop him from some semblance of self-preservation. It is in his faith in Jesus that became uh, the pivotal moment in his life, moving away from the constraints of time and focusing instead on the future, focusing instead on what truly matters, even if it were to cost him his life especially if it was to cost him his life. He's not naive. He understands the consequences. Quite the opposite. He fully embraces 
and accepts that as a potential reality. And should he die because of it? Should he die because he puts Christ first? I read no fear in his response. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There's no boast here. There's no exaggerated persuasive, persuasive speech that I read here. This is Paul's reality, and he's merely stating a fact. To truly live, one must live in Christ. And if something is stopping you from this end, you shake it off and you keep your eyes on the heavens. Life is precious. It is a wonderful gift and it should be cherished. And it's not the end. That is the good news, isn't it? This life that we have is so precious. It is wonderful and beautiful and beyond comprehension at its intricacies. And we're only getting started. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If those are our options, what power does fear truly have over us? I say we choose faith. My wife struggled in March, as many of us did. As a mother, she feels it is her life duty to keep each of us safe, happy, and healthy. But being dealt something that she had no control over shook her. How could she keep everybody safe from the unknown? How could she shield us from the fear? How could she continue while the world seemed to be falling apart? And her answer? I can't. She knew this was bigger than her, and I am so grateful. I am so grateful to have such a God-fearing, God-loving woman in my life. She went to him. She relied on his words. Every day she played a collection of verses that recommitted us all in choosing faith over fear. And I'm going to play those for you now. It is a collection of 16 verses. It's very short. It's a collection of 16 verses, and you will hear one that repeats itself because it is from the Gospels. Two of them are. So just listen to these words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? 
Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. you please sing the hymn with me today? Lord, whose love is humble service. Please stand.
Please join with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. We remember in prayer Brandy Burrow, Robert Royce, Sandy Rothmeyer, Betty Monroe, Jax Baxter, Betty Johansson, and the family and friends of Gordon Feaster. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Your special care is requested with our special friend Elizabeth, Elizabeth of Ethiopia as they are in urgent need of food and assistance for their youth in their care. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us, the likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else that you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share that peace with your neighbor by waving. And if you'll be seated, we have special music that is going to be from Janet Halverson.
Please stand and recite the Lord's Prayer. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Mother in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you in the way of truth and life. Amen. Our sending song is, The Lord Now Sends Us Forth.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Please remember you're going to be ushered out the back by the ushers. Have a great week.